Why does it matter if the earth is a ball or a plane? My life doesn't change. My bills remain the same. My relationship with my spouse and my children don't change at all. My health is not affected by what shape I think the earth is. Doesn't it seem silly that it means so much to some people? Well, let me tell you my thoughts on this. And it has to do with one word. Prison. The baseline we have to get to is that there are people in the world that are not like us. They don't think like us. They don't care about your well-being and they don't care about anything but themselves. They don't care about humanity. They don't care about the well-being of your children or the human project in any way. Those people exist. Unfortunately, those people also seem to have a very common tendency and that's to gain power. To rule over people, you have to either imprison them or convince them to not revolt. The word prison is the reason that this floating, spinning ball has been presented to us. If you think about it, the sphere is a prison, and it's one that will drive you crazy. You can walk around in the same direction and end up right where you started. Start spinning it, and it even takes you in into different ways of being disoriented. Do we have any reason to think 500 years ago without ever having lifted a balloon that the earth was a spinning ball. A few experiments happened. None would have stuck with the Nikon P900 right now. And somehow without the technology we had today, we were able to determine that the sun was 93 million miles away. The reason they used that is because of circular logic. The sun had to be very, very far away in order for these things to work. The math wouldn't work with a close sun, or at least it would yield parallel results. And I'm not going to get into the the reasons why the math, you know, doesn't jive in both sides of the argument. There's plenty of that out there, and feel free to go look for it. But there are two types of prisons. One prison is a physical prison. It's a wall with cells. It has bars. The other prison is a prison of the mind. A prison without walls. Which one do you think is more effective? I think it's the latter. If you think about it, a prisoner that has walls built around him that knows what's on the other side already is hard to control. You have to take a lot of precautions. He daydreams about breaking out of his cell and finding freedom. Regardless of the reason he's in there, if he's human, and has known what's on the other side, has known freedom, he will yearn to leave his physical barriers. And that's dangerous. There's also 
The second type of prison, the prison of the mind, the prison without bars. These prisoners are much easier to control. They control each other. They control themselves. They control their speech. They're afraid with every step they take. They have no confidence that there is any hope at all on the other side of this wall that isn't even there. If they convince someone that even if they climb that wall, all that waits is just a worse prison, more misery, more despair. You don't really have to do a lot of work from that point going forward to control this person. Create a community of these people that look after each other, around each other, and they will uh, they'll spiral. They will literally create their own community with this. And it's all built out of fear, of course. So, a sphere is a perfect prison because you can't leave it. If you just walk in one direction, you end up right back where you were. You're walking in circles. You can never get any farther. So they've taken away the need for bars and said that here we are. We are on this ball and the only people that can leave it ever are the high priests, the masons, the, the astronauts. You can't leave it, but we'll tell you about it. We'll report back. We'll take your money along the way. But if you find yourself thinking that something just isn't right, there's a reason for that. I believe that there is something in us that is looking for truth. Not all of us. You can look around and know the people that don't want the truth. So, so why do words matter so much, especially when flat earth shouldn't matter that much. Well, let's look at the basis of what the flat earth means, the heliocentric model. Think about what we are forced to say, even if we don't say the words exactly the same as what I'm gonna to present to you. If the earth is rotating and the sun is stationary, then the, we just get shown the sun that is so far away that we can't even go there. And even if we did, we would die a horrible death of fire and fury. So basically, and I'm using the word sun, and whether you think God made the sun along with everything else in the universe or not, let's just refer to it is God's son or just the son. What we're forced to say from the cradle, looking at the, the mobiles and all the, the, the sun and all the planets that just dance around, all the spheres, all the places that you can walk all day long and never go anywhere else. Think about what you're forced to say in your head from day one. The sun has never risen. God's sun has never risen. And it will not rise again because it never has been. It has never been anything but a hot ball of air. Now think about the power that goes along with getting an entire society to say those words to convince other people to say those words, to convince our teachers to teach our children. And those children grow up to be teachers and they teach their children, their students. The sun has never risen. The sun is not what we are told. 
It's a farce. And because the sun is just an accidental ball of gas, then of course there is no God. The words do matter. So there's a reason why they want us to say the sun never rises. What's between you and the sun, according to our textbooks? Nothing. Nothingness. A vacuum. A void. Despair. Certain death. Dark matter. 95% of it is dark matter. And I can test that they got a little, little cocky with that term. It wasn't enough just to convince us that space is a void of nothingness between your heart and the sun that they had to take it a step further. And this is what they do. This is what evil does. They have to make you believe the lie. They can't just put a gun in your hand and make you blow your brains out. They have to convince you that it's a good idea. They have to make you punch yourself in the face and then beg for more. And then look around and wonder why times are weird. First of all, they call it dark matter. Now, what is it? It's, it's like nothingness on steroids. Yet it binds the universe together. Think about the words, dark matter. It's not butterfly matter. It's not light matter, it's dark matter. It's that which it hides in the shadows. You can't define it. It's dark. It's void of anything. It's cloaked. It's secretive. So the most secretive cloaked, dark thing we know in the universe that makes up 95% of it, according to science, is called dark matter. Why would they call it that? Why are they able to get away with 95% of everything to be nothingness? Everything between you and the sun right now is just nothingness and despair and void and cold and a vacuum. And there's no reason to, to try because the sun is so far away that even if you tried, you couldn't get there. Even if you did find a way to get there, you would die. You would die a horrible death. Think about the, the versions of our origin in the textbooks. Just picture the, the things you, you read about in you know, the primordial soup. Think about that versus Genesis. Let's, let's do the, the textbook part first. The powers that be want us to believe that this awesome thing that produced puppies and children and the way that your wife looks at you when she thinks you, you're her hero and the way that the air smells after a football field has just been cut and ready to play a game on. Think about where they tell you this, this awesome stuff came from, where we came from. They'll tell you in textbooks, not just in circles of conversation, they make you read it. We came from an accident and we got lucky enough 
to be spawned from primordial slime. The place we live was spawn and us and everything that came along with it was just a worthless, accidental, sulfur-ridden, stenchy slime with nothing but storms and volcanic activity and all these things that just bring up these ideas of just total chaos. And then just luckily, one right after the other, that slime became just a little less stinky, a little less slimy. And then eventually we get here. And that's, that's the story we're told. We're nothing. We're just pieces of shit. We're lucky we even got to be pieces of shit to begin with. Think about the psychology that goes with that. Okay, so now we're convinced to say two things if we believe in textbooks. The sun never rises. The sun has never risen and never will. And we're just spawn of slime and shit. Now let's look at the, the Genesis version of this. By Genesis version, there's light, there's creation. By their version, just think about it this way. How awesome would it be if their version is true? In direct opposition to our textbook versions, how awesome would it be to witness a mountain to rise? To witness the creation of man and woman of the separation of waters above and below. How awesome would it be to be able to just go back and witness that moment? Would that be inspiring? You bet it is. You bet it would be. Do you believe Satan wants you to think about things that way? Do you think the powers that be want you concentrating on what a piece of shit you are and where you came from and the slimy past that you were lucky to even have. Just enjoy your time here and shut up and eat your soup. Or to daydream about how awesome creation is. To daydream about what you were made to put here for. Do you realize how scared that makes People who want to control large populations, the psychopaths that, for whatever reason, didn't get it right. Do you realize the danger that we put them in when we start thinking of it in that way? Not only am I created in the image of God, if you think about it that way, I get all the stuff that goes along with it. I get the confidence with being created in the image of God. I get to go about my day knowing, knowing, not hoping, knowing that I've been created in the image of God. That cannot be challenged by any evilness. They can't do it because... Once they realize that you can be free inside the bars that they've created, then you're going to look for a different route. The bars they've created is the sphere. It is a fake jail. You know what it's not? An infinite plane. We can't comprehend infinity by definition. But for some reason, it's perfectly sane to watch a TV show on the Sci-Fi Channel and say space is infinite. But we're not allowed to say without being ridiculed that the plane we live on is infinite. There's got to be an edge. You see, it's all word games. It's all just psychology. Of course it's reasonable to think the plane is infinite if we can think that space is infinite. 
Science supports it way more than an expanding universe and you don't need a chalkboard to go up in a balloon and just look. You don't need to trust anyone. And the reason that that I think I was originally inspired by the idea that we might have been lied to is not because I care about the shape of the earth. It's just the idea that there's something spiritual about getting it right, about finding the truth. And maybe everyone's journey is different. Maybe some people want to find out the truth of something in their own life that has nothing to do with this. Me personally, this touched me. And this is why I'm sharing it. And uh, I'm going to jump into this uh, and touch on this one last thing. And it has to do with the Trinity. And this all does tie together. And it has to do with the Trinity and it has to do with water. And this is a little bit out there and this is, I've never heard anyone refer to this subject matter ever. At least in the way that I'm getting ready to talk to you about it. I believe that God in its physical form, in his physical form, as the Trinity, as we experience God, is water. I know that seems weird, but water in itself is a miracle. Water takes three forms and is all at once. Water is everywhere. Water forms the clouds above in the heavens. Water, form, water forms the sea below. Water is what we breathe in and out. We are born in water. And without water, there is no life. I think there's something we're supposed to find in that. It's a riddle, and I'm not claiming to know much more than that. But in our lives, water can be a gas, a liquid, and a solid. And what makes it such a miracle is the lattice work that the, the ice forms is protection. For the seas below. If water was made any other way, lakes would freeze down to the bottom, but they just won't. You can't do it. The firmament contains the moon and stars. So what you have is the Father, which is everything. The earth, the foundation, the physics, the breath, life, Everything, everything is encompassed within the Father. You cannot build a foundation without all of these things. They have to be in place and they have to be solid. They have to be trustworthy. They have to be certain and sure and good. The Father, and then you have the Son. Life comes from the Son. It also is attached to promise, the promise of a new day, hope, certainty. There will be a sun rising tomorrow. The sun will rise again. The sun has risen. Those, those nasty words they don't want us saying. And I believe the Holy Ghost is the firmament. the moon and the stars, the things that we can't really put our hands on. But I think it goes a little deeper than that. It goes into the angels singing in the heavens, knowing that you should trust your intuition, that there's something else out there, something that drives us. Dimensions, the idea, I guess your muse, that's the Holy Ghost and they all work together. Without the Father being everything, the physics of where we live, the foundation, the Father, then the Son, that if you look across the water, is always reflecting on you as a personal experience. 
And then the ghost, the Holy Ghost is the one that inspires you to enjoy it the way we're supposed to. Don't think about the sun rising or rising again tomorrow or having already risen. Don't you say such words. Never say those words. Never utter them or you will be ridiculed and berated and mocked. And in some cases, your life ruined. In some cases, your life ended should you say such things. The sun is just hot air. And even if you could go there, God's sun is too far away from you to reach. So don't you ever say those words. Words matter. I think it's time we pay attention to it and quit fooling ourselves to thinking that the things that are so crazy are because of an accident. There's someone behind the curtains there that are pulling strings, but they have no power once you know what you're dealing with. There's not nothing between us and the sun. The sun is close and the sun shines on us every day and will again tomorrow. The sun will rise again. The sun has risen.